I know how to use this. All right, great. As I'm delighted to be here, and um, I'm also, I'm sure you get to eat like this every every week. So uh, I've I've read your I've read your syllabus, and it looks like a great class. And a lot of this topics I'll cover today actually have probably is, you've read about previously. You've got some great books and uh, and the like. And I want to take you through both uh, the arc of Fomsenon's life, but also bring you into uh, some of my own thinking uh, about this. And I'm really looking forward to questions uh, from, from all of you, is because I know you've read chapters one, five, and six. I was telling Hang last night that I reread chapters one, five, and six last night, and I had forgotten that I had written some of the stuff in there. Uh, and um, you know, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully uh, you, you uh, will have questions about that or other chapters in the book, uh, because uh, um, I think, especially the prologue, which uh, I'd be happy to talk about um, as, as well. So uh, I wanna begin by letting you know that, so we're here talking about Perfect Spy, the English copy, right? But there is a Vietnamese edition as well. And the Vietnamese edition, this one here, still remains, uh, the top selling nonfiction book in Vietnam. It's been very successful. One of the reasons uh, that, as Hang described, that I think my reception of Vietnam has been so uh, good has been by because of the Vietnamese uh, edition. Uh, when the English edition was first published, uh, it was, you couldn't get it in Vietnam, but of course, you know, there are the bootleg uh, operations in Vietnam where people uh, make Xerox copies of books and then sell them on the street corner. And I have a photo somewhere of me buying a copy of my book, negotiating it down from $15 to $3, which uh, uh, to buy out my own copy. And I still keep that copy as a reminder because times have changed now. Now the English copy is available everywhere in Vietnam, almost every bookstore. Uh, there have been book talks in Vietnam and the like, but over the last 15 or 20 years, there's been a whole wave change uh, with respect to the things. But there was actually a first edition in Vietnam, which is the one you're looking at right there to the, on, on the left. And uh, that was really upsetting to me and a real challenge because that first edition, I don't read Vietnamese and I don't speak Vietnamese, but I relied on, uh, on two people who did. And in order for me to have a, the very first Vietnamese edition, uh, I was required to make about 10 or 15 really major uh, 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 concessions. Uh, and it upset me, but I wanted to have the book in Vietnam, and I was advised that, uh, you know, the English book's now available, so publish the first edition of the Vietnamese edition, and then the English edition is there, and people can see the difference. They'll be able to see it, because there were some edits I'll show you uh, later, but it was heavily censored. It was very upsetting to me, and I had a five-year contract, and as soon as that, whoops, I hit something there. Let me go, um, let me get out of this. Uh, well, it doesn't, yeah. I, all I did was put my hand down here. Oh, gosh. Okay, thanks. Don't, don't go far. Uh, <laughs> and uh, 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 on that. Uh, and uh, so I know you received from uh, from Hang the uh, the WikiLeaks. So I, I was always puzzled by a lot of things. And then when when the WikiLeaks were released, lo and behold, there's a memo in WikiLeaks about uh, my book and Cablegate, a perfect spy provides insights into the Vietnamese. And what it was about, it was a battle uh, between the Vietnamese government and the arm of the Vietnamese government, the Vietnam, Vietnamese uh, uh, publishing house, which was publishing the first edition about whether or not to publish uh, the book. And it was, if you've read, I know all the students have read it, but if, and if, and those of you who, uh, are, on, are watching on Zoom, you can just go to the, the citations over there. You can go and you can read about this. But it was a really bizarre discussion about whether or not my book should be published in Vietnam. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it right here. But, uh, but I think you should read it carefully to realize how schizophrenic uh, it was at that time uh, because of the issues that I was raising about Don and the fact that they were aware that there was an English edition, obviously, uh, as 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 well, and now I'm, I didn't mention this, but a major motion picture is now being made about the movie. I'm really excited about it. The director is this gentleman, uh, Charlie Wynn, uh, Vietnamese American from California who now lives in Vietnam. 
And we're in the advanced stage of writing the script right now. And uh, we're very, very excited, particularly given the rise on uh, the popularity um, like the recent Oscars and the like of, and receptivity of, of, of having uh, a predominantly Asian cast uh, with an Asian lead, uh, Pham Soon An, uh, and trying to tell that story in a way that would be interesting to a worldwide audience. Uh, I had optioned up this book about three or four times, and the most difficult part has been every time I optioned it, uh, the person who took the option yeah. then could not wrote a script or got a script written and couldn't sell it in Hollywood. And the reason is, is that Hollywood was, was really not interested for a very long time, still not, about a, a movie in which America is defeated. Not only defeated, but defeated by an Asian guy by the name of Pham Soon An, who most people can't even pronounce his name. And, and the reasons for it. And I can't tell you how many doors um, my agent and I knocked on about this and how disheartening it was, but I never let go of the dream that one day this could happen and it's going to happen now. And about two years from now, there, there will be a film and we're excited about it because uh, uh, Vietnam has never really had uh, a film uh, that has been seen, uh, has been nominated for anything like at the Academy Awards, but almost no presence at any of the, the worldwide film festivals and the like. And the people who've invested heavily in this film are seeing it as, an, as a way of perhaps, uh, of, perhaps of, uh, of breaking into that. It's all a dream. I don't want to put too much into it now, except that it keeps me, at my age, it keeps me wanting to live longer and cutting back on my cholesterol <laughs> and things, you know, checking my blood pressure regularly, trying just to make sure I can make it you know, thinking about what I might look like, which tux I'll wear, you know, but it, it's fun. It's fun to just dream always when you're your age and when you're my age, it's uh, it's just fun. But I'm here to talk about this man and, and tell you a little about his story. So you already know uh, everything that's on here. There was a public Pham Soon An, right? He was a spy, right? Uh, but he had a public persona. And I remember going to the spy museum in Washington, D.C. and seeing him just as a tourist and seeing an exhibit about Ah. And I thought it was how cool it was that I had written a book and and uh, and uh, there was no mention of my book or anything there, but they had, but they were, it was about his public persona and how he operated. Almost all of it was taken from my book. Another example of non-attribution. Uh, but I know you always cite your sources, so I'm not worried about that. But uh, he did, he spoke English very well. He, he, he could really interact with, uh, with, with people. He had studied in the United States. I'm really spent some time on that. And, and the like. He was, to, for all intents and purposes, he was just on our side. Um, and and this, this is who he was. And here he is, there's several pictures I'm just gonna run through quickly. This is his card that gave Matt Military Assistance Command Vietnam, allowed him to go anywhere where Mac V was. There's another picture of Von back in the day. Here he is with the South Vietnamese leadership uh, going over maps uh, and the like. Uh, this is one of my favorite. It's a, a Richard Avedon photo of on whispering into the ear of Bob Chaplin, who was the New Yorker Far East correspondent. And I like it because everyone wanted to get the tips that on had. And one thing I want to say right at the beginning uh, uh, is that on to protect his cover as a spy, to protect himself as someone who was involved in strategic intelligence. Right, he wasn't like this James Bond kind of spy or anything. He was a uh, uh, he didn't have, drive fast cars. It, it didn't have a crazy lifestyle. He was involved in strategic analytical uh, 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 spying, which I'll talk I'll talk about in a minute. But his in order to protect that, he had to be uh, in public as straight as he could be. So he never influenced the news to tilt it towards a communist perspective. For example, for all the news outlets he worked for. No, he never gave any hint of his loyalties to the VC uh, or to uh, the revolution. He actually acted as if um, just the opposite in order to protect himself uh, and to protect his mission. And I'll be talking about his mission as well. Here he is again in the bottom left-hand side at a, at a MACV press conference. He was just everywhere. This is from the New York Times uh, magazine. It was an article about the Vietnam War and there's on, always with his cigarette, 55 years of smoking lucky strikes, eventually killed him. Uh, but uh, uh, he, he seemed to be everywhere. I call him Zelig um, before his time, uh, showing up in almost every place. There he is in Time Magazine, the headquarters. 
Now, I love this picture because uh, this is uh, 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 that that right next to him is Francis Fitzgerald, the author of Fire in the Lake, and uh, all the way at the end is Beverly Deep, uh, 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 who just published her memoirs. For the, uh, she was a professor of journalism at the University of Hawaii for a long time. She was just highly respected uh, by people who uh, by people whose business it was was to smell out the truth right, the media, but he's also respected by the CIA agents in Vietnam. He was respected uh, by the South Vietnamese. So people always say, well, he was, it was easy for An to fool the Americans. Yes, but it was also easy, easier for him to fool the South Vietnamese, the Arvin, and all the other contacts he had. His, his, his best sources came from the Vietnamese Central Intelligence Organization. All right. So he was getting things from everybody on both sides because they all trusted him, uh, which is why. Well, I'll, I'll tell them. Well, and they trusted him so much because he was a sing, You know, they didn't know this, but he was operating as a singleton in the espionage business. A singleton is someone. It's a single cell agent who was who was put in and he relies on interpersonal relations and he relies on interpersonal uh, well uh, relationships and making people feel that they can trust him so he can obtain information from you, which is why after the world, after uh, the, the, the attack on the World Trade Center uh, in 2001, about two years later, I was approached by Homeland Security. And I was a professor at that time at the University of California, Davis. And they came to see me in my office. It was right after the book had been published. So it was about a year after the book had been published. And they, they wanted to see all my notes. They asked if they could see my notes. They didn't come in. It wasn't like a Mar-a-Lago, you know, or anything like that. Um, and, uh, you know, they came in and uh, they, uh, uh, they, they, uh, uh, and I, I was curious to know why, uh, why? Um, and the reason is, is because, uh, first of all, the book is assigned in first year uh, agency uh, reading for people, because it's an example of a, the success of a single planted agent in, 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 in a society uh, with the goal of obtaining information. But secondly, they were hoping that they could pick up clues uh, to understand uh, how the Saudis had infiltrated because they also lived amongst us and gone to college with us and everything. It was a very interesting, uh, I, I don't think I was that much help, but it was, it was really interesting that they went through all that stuff uh, uh, with, uh, with me. And so An could always be, part of his cover was always uh, uh, with his dog, German Shepherd, his name was King. Uh, he was always walking with King everywhere. What very few people knew, of course, because again, this is the public on, was that that dog had been trained, trained to relieve himself uh, at a certain tree, which was also serving as a drop area for On. So he could stop there and a dog would, you know, take care of his business and On could uh, uh, either leave a message or pick something up from his longtime uh, courier. And he was all. He was also uh, 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 one of the Saigon's uh, best known uh, bird purveyors. He, he loved birds, collected birds. But the real advantage of this, that was his public persona, was in private, as, as you've read in chapter five, uh, that he and Win Ti Ba would meet at the bird market um, in Saigon, and it was the, people would think nothing of on going to the bird market because. He was a bird man, you know, basically, and that was his thing. He collected birds, and so when he met, met Ba, this was all seemed natural. Uh, so before I go into, I want to just now just cast on in uh, uh, historically. That is, he was born in 1927, right? He was born in southern Vietnam, but most important, and you know, he, his father was a land surveyor. But most important, his father. Uh, uh, was working for the French at the time, and actually you might even describe him as an aristocrat in a way. That is, he traveled with his father on, and he would see the deplorable conditions that French colonialism had done in Vietnam. He would often describe the, 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 the situation as more dire than anyone could ever imagine, the effects of colonialism. And uh, he was attracted, like a lot of young Vietnamese, he was attracted to the revolution. The, fir uh, the first Vietnamese revolution of 46 to 54. And I will cast on today and until the day I die as a Vietnamese nationalist. That is how I see him. He was a member of the communist party. He was a communist. 
but he was a nationalist. And I, we can talk about in Q&A the difference between that and some of the attacks that have been leveled on me uh, from certain outfits who say there's no difference between uh, what I'm, the, the, the line I'm describing of, of him being a nationalist compared to him being a hardcore Stalinist, okay? And there's a big difference uh, and that I'll develop that. Uh, but when he joined the revolution in 1946, he wanted just to end foreign domination, right? He had, you know, and we're talking about the Japanese and the French at that time, the Americans would come later. And he joined Ho Chi Minh. He was attracted to Ho Chi Minh. And, and indeed, here's a picture of Han that I did not have available when I did the book, but someone shared it with me. And uh, uh, he's leading a student uh, uh, protest here. And the exact quotation of that is, Hank, hey, can you just translate that for me? Or can someone translate it exactly? Yeah, yeah the Southern the Southern Vietnamese Student Association. And what they're protesting is they're, they're protesting uh, against Japan, the Japanese, right? And, uh, and here he is as a young man. And I think this picture helps me to close the loop, something I was unable to do when I was writing the book. book. Um, and here I just list what I think are the important bullets for, uh, uh, for you to uh, be thinking about uh, here. And of course, he was recruited by the by uh, the revolution uh, uh, to to join the party, and the party decided to make him a spy. And why did they decide to make him a spy? It's because he had a natural fluency for languages. Right? He already spoke three languages, and he had learned English uh, from uh, missionaries. And it was it was not perfect, but it was really good. Um, and of course, he spoke Vietnamese and he spoke French. All right, and he had this fluency, and there was something about on uh, that the people that the, the, the revolution realized we can take advantage of this guy. Now, when they were thinking about making him a spy, An didn't want any part of that. He thought spies were like stool pigeons, right? And it was something that he didn't really didn't attract him, but he had really no choice, and uh, and he, he and so he went along with it, and he would develop the role. And when he would be sent to America, it was not so much to be a spy, but to learn about the Americans and their culture and the like. And I'll, I'll cover that momentarily. But, you know, throughout all of this, he had a secret, right? And that secret is, again, you've read chapters one, five, and six. You know what that secret was. He was actually a, a, a secret agent operating out of Kuchi. And I want to talk about this 863 a second. And I love that the fact that in Vietnam and elsewhere, uh, you know, the on his name, it does mean hidden and concealed. So his life is his name in many ways. And I always think about, uh, I always think, I always think about that. So, so Anna sworn into the party in Southern Vietnam uh, by Le Doc Tho. Uh, and, uh, uh, and he's immediately, he's immediately uh, uh, put into contact with two or three spies uh, to help him learn that, the statecraft to learn what was to be necessary. So all the pictures I'm going to show you now are actually, uh, he's still, he's working his mission now. This is the public on who's now a spy, right? And uh, here he is with the, uh, wearing the uniform. He wore two different uniforms here. This uniform is a, 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 a the, he's, it's, a, it's an Arvin, a South, he's with the South Vietnamese. Um, and he's just blending in right here. Uh, here he is at a reception, uh, uh, just a, uh, uh, blend, uh, again, uh, blending in. And here are the 863. This is obviously, these are pictures of these as older people. This is a remarkable network. I've had it, I, I've interviewed and spent time with all of the surviving members. They started off with over 55. And during the war, over half of them were killed during the war, carrying on messages uh, uh, from Saigon all the way up to Cosvin, where eventually they would be opened and read by uh, by 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 North Vietnamese uh, 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 leadership, and uh, 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 those of you who read chapters on the Columbia, you all read it uh, at, at the University of California. I always have to say, those of you who bother to read the book, um, but uh, uh, this is uh, I know I went to Princeton, so I get that Ivy League stuff. So uh, uh, the gentleman in this picture uh, with the cap on, that's Tu Kong who you remember with the pistols in chapter five and six. And he's still alive and uh, he's been a great source of help to me in writing, in, 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 
even in preparation to film people, the people making the movie had been spending days with him, uh, talking to him about um, um, this is Win T. Ba, his uh, courier, uh, who would be later like on promoted to the rank of, 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 of general. And there's Baba and me, when, uh, as she was known. And this is when I was younger as well. And, uh, uh, and like, and there's Tukan. I love that picture of him. And uh, uh, there we are together with his, with his, with his uh, exploit medal, with his commendations. And these are uh, Miss Tam and uh, Thompson uh, and, uh, and, and uh, Tukan at a celebration. They're venerated in, in Vietnam. And they had, I had this opportunity where they took me back to how the courier system worked. And we don't have enough time to go into it right now, but it was really remarkable how on, again, outlined in the book, how on would meet with Winti Ba. He would write the reports in invisible ink. He would wrap them in, uh, in, in traditional Vietnamese rolls. He would then meet uh, uh, Winti Ba uh, uh, in some busy place. Ba had no idea where he le lived, never knew it, it, anything about his family. She was illiterate, but the two of them formed an amazing team. You think about all the technology that was brought by the US side into the war and all the amazing intelligence we had. And here's this uh, woman who chewed uh, beetle juice and her teeth were blacked out, didn't read. Uh, and uh, she would meet on and her job, one job was to, uh, uh, to take those reports and bring them to the next uh, 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 spot where 863 would pick it up. And then 863 through a whole method uh, of, of rivers and jungle would get that report up to Cosvin. It wasn't like they could uh, uh, you know, uh, send it by Morse code or anything like that. These were all hand, 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 hand carried. And uh, uh, his reports were so good and you've read one of them, uh, about one of them in the, uh, two of them actually in chapters five and six, that General Ziaf proclaimed, we are in the American war room and there's the American war room, of course. And, uh, but uh, on after the war, so during the war, on had no idea, no idea that he had received, he didn't know anything about his reports until Tu Kong actually had told him something in, during the Tet Offensive. But he was brought to Hanoi, he was promoted to the rank of general made a hero of the revolution. And remember I told you about uh, how heavily abridged the first edition of my Vietnamese book was. And the one that caused me the greatest angst I was most upset about was this picture. So there's, this was in the, this is in the English edition. And this is, whoops, sorry. Um, okay. Um, okay, I, I can only go back this way, got it. Uh, so this was in the English edition, a book that uh, uh, if you, you some people, I know one person has it, it's carrying, but this book was in the Vietnamese edition. Uh, this picture was in the Vietnamese edition. So you notice that this guy has been blocked out on the right. Who is that guy? That guy is Bui Tin. And Bui Tin has been banished from all of Vietnamese history books, right? He no longer exists, which is what the power of a socialist republic can do at times. Uh, and that's because while he was, he was remarkably loyal uh, during the war, had been a colonel, was involved in the media, but also uh, uh, was relied on by, 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 by the North's leaders. After the war, he wrote a book called Following Ho Chi Minh. And that book was extremely critical, extremely critical of the victors. Uh, and he asked what had happened to the money and the gold, the dream of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the revolution, which was to help the people. That instead, what he, what Bui Tin wrote was that what he saw was that the leaders were getting richer and fatter and healthier and living in great houses. And that was great. But the people, and this is uh, on Thompson on shared this with you, uh, uh, were suffering still. And uh, he was banished. He, uh, he lived the rest of his life in exile and fled uh, in France and died about three years ago in France, where he actually ran a opposition radio um, uh, network uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the government. But that's an example of the kind of thing I had to agree to, uh, to uh, get that Vietnamese edition in. The other one, of course, was there's several, but when uh, the two that were deleted completely was were on said to me and others, if I had known I was trading, and this is consistent with what I just told you, if I had known I was trading 
the Americans for the Soviets, I would have stayed with the Americans, meaning that the Soviet model had econo of economic had failed uh, in Vietnam. There was no, this is before Des Moines, it's where, you know, there was no food, no electricity, no power. Uh, I mean, Vietnam was a basket case with only allies with Cuba and, uh, one, one, uh, and one, one, uh, one or two other countries, but isolated from the world. And, uh, and the other, so that quote was taken out uh, and An told me that it was taken out because uh, even though everyone knows it, no one can say it. Um, and the other was An told me in the English edition, you could read it in the English edition, like you read both of these things in the English edition. Uh, An told me that the two happiest years of his life, totally stress-free, were spent in 1957 to 59, the years that he lived in America. And that was changed. And I had to agree to that change. It was changed because no Vietnamese hero of the revolution, no general could ever say uh, that the two happiest years of his life were in America. It had to be in Vietnam. So it was changed to, I spent two enjoyable years in America. And again, people who read the English edition get a big kick out of comparing the, the, those two. Now, I'm happy to say in the second Vietnamese edition, uh, almost all of that has been corrected, except this picture, no way, no way, no way that will ever, I'd lose my, 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 I'd lose my visa. I wouldn't be able to get in and, uh, and I'm alive. Uh, so after the war, he was elevated to the rank of hero. And this sets up chapters five and six. He was promoted to the rank of general, uh, identified as Vietnam's uh, top spy. No problem. Uh, and uh, received several uh, medals. 16 in all, 16 exploit medals for the role he played in the communist victory in, in Vietnam. And here's the picture that when people saw this picture of An in his uniform, uh, particularly as American friends, we all said, whoa, that's Pham Soon An? Is that the real Pham Soon An? Uh, but the real question I have about the arc of his life is, who is the real Pham Soon An? How can we find out how can we understand that? And the bulk of my talk today would be, about 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 that. Who was the real pop singer? And uh, here's another picture of Ahn with you know all the victorious generals uh, and and uh, and the like. And of course, everyone wanted to write about Ahn. I mean, a lot of people wanted to write, but but Ahn kept saying no. All right, he kept saying no because he thought that he had too many secrets. And so, eventually, two books about him were written by Vietnamese journalists. Uh, in 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 Vietnam, uh, he turned down five hundred thousand dollar advance uh, for uh, Stanley Carnow, who wrote a book Vietnam, and David Falberstam, the very fair, best of the brightest, to write a me his memoir. Neil Sheehan, who won, won the Pulitzer Prize for for uh, a bright shining lie, uh, wanted to write about his life. He said no. He didn't want anyone who knew him during the war to write about him. And then along came me, right? <laughs> um, and uh, I, uh, I tell the story in chapter, in my, in my introduction to how I met on. We don't have enough time to go, to go into that right now, but I will say I met him by accident. Uh, we were at a dinner. How many people in the room read that for introduction about how I met him? Okay, great, okay, great. So you know uh, uh, that, that's, that, that, that story. And I beseeched him and I begged him to allow me to write the book. And initially he said, many years later, after, after how I met him. And uh, there's the first night we met each other um, and uh, at that Song New restaurant. And I just show you that picture uh, because I don't think it's in the book. Um, and, uh, we're, and, and that night changed my life in, in many ways, in, in many ways. But it wasn't, Hang mentioned, I didn't know she was gonna mention No Peace, No Honor, but it wasn't until uh, on, Red, no peace, no honor. What happened there was, as you know, when I first met on, I was writing a book about the Paris negotiations to end the war in Vietnam. That was what I was writing on. It was my, uh, and uh, this was in the year 2000, 2001, when I, when I arrived in Vietnam for the first time in the summer of 2001. And, uh, uh, and on told me, I know a lot about that subject, the Paris peace negotiations. Why, why don't we meet tomorrow at Givral, right? But I was supposed to leave, I was, I, I had a scheduling conflict, right? And I changed everything, I changed my mind, I met with him the next day. 
and he told me a lot about the Paris negotiations. And then he read my book. And after reading the book, he told me, after I besieged him, besieged him, told me that he thought I had, it was the first book that he had read, which gave a voice to the Vietnamese side, that I had, he thought, objectively portrayed the Vietnamese and the American perspectives, perspectives and that I was being an objective, as much as I could, historian. And he respected that, which was, I took as a great, I, I appreciated him saying that. And, uh, and, and I'm, I'm really still making a living off of that book, which is good um, And uh, on that. But then after smoking uh, Lucky Strike cigarettes for 55 years, you know, he was introduced to smoking by the Americans. And he always used to joke, you see the Americans finally killed me. It just took them longer. Uh, th this was a photo in the Saigon uh, newspaper saying that General Pham Son An, hero of the revolution, uh, is about to die. Uh, and the country was preparing for his funeral, et cetera. They removed half of his lung. Uh, he had terrible emphysema, but he didn't die. He lived and he, uh, and he went home. And when he went home, everything had changed. We no longer met in Gibral, but we met, he, let, he had to live downstairs because he couldn't go upstairs because of his, he's so weak actually. And uh, uh, he lived downstairs as an oxygen tank next to his bed. And we would meet here. And this is the place right here where I beseeched him to say, ah, before you die, someone's got to write your story. Someone's got to do this. And like, this can't be Vietnamese journalists. It's just like, because in the Vietnam journalism world, everything was well, just so censored. And also, it was like reading a childhood book about Abraham Lincoln, okay? Um, or uh, George Washington, it could not tell a lie. You know, Lincoln, the baby Crockett, it just ain't any, any historical character. And uh, he said, yes, he said, yes. I immediately took a sabbatical and I spent the, the next two years with Ag. He, he thought he only had six months to live, but he lived two more years. And I was constantly uh, uh, thinking that the last time, this would be the last time I would see him, but he kept talking and he really opened up. He was a very cheery on in his house with all of his books. But so we began these working sessions and uh, uh, yeah, everything's been recorded. Everything, I, every paper, every document, for my book, I've already donated to the Vietnam Archive at Texas Tech University. If any of you go online and just read that, those of you who are working on Agent Orange, for example, and elsewhere, you go on to the, you probably know this, just use the Vietnam Archive at Texas Tech. They digitized records, which is extraordinary, as are other records dealing with, uh, with Agent Orange. So I started taking things out. You know, they, they, I've told this story before, but it's not in the book, which is that. So An was supposed to die. So the family had had a coffin and the coffin was prepared, but then he didn't die. So they'd already bought the coffin, right? So they put it in the backyard. And in the Vietnamese, the Vietnamese tradition, you know, you go to the next life, you go to your next life with all your secrets. So his wife, Tu Nan, had put all of these documents and everything that An had around the house into the coffin. So when An would be buried, he'd be buried with his secrets. So he lived, he came back, and I don't know, we'd go into the yard and we'd open up the coffin to, uh, and, and go through and put, pick up documents. And it was a, it was a trip. I mean, no, no, I mean uh, and it's, it, it, you, you, had a, you couldn't make this up, all right? So anyway, uh, uh, it was really uh, wonderful. So he started showing me these fields for all of these confidential documents that he got. Now today you could go online and find these at Texas Tech, the National Archives, but back then, you see, these are more confidential. He was a reporter for Time Magazine. How is he getting them? Well, he's getting them because NACV, the Military Assistance Command of Vietnam, the South Vietnamese uh, uh, Arvin, and the CIO, the intelligence agencies, they all had them. These were documents shared amongst the leaders of the three or four intelligence networks uh, that were supporting the US military venture in Vietnam. So I never had to steal a document, they were actually asking on to help them interpret these documents. So on would read them, he would take them home, he would analyze them. Uh, he learned uh, strategic intelligence from reading a book by uh, someone by the name of Sherman Kent had written, and uh, which is about how to be an analytic uh, agent. Again, not someone like James Bond or a spy and using you know, two or three fancy uh, guns, guns that, from, from cards or cards that, Loaded water and all those things. His job was intellectual, cerebral. 
uh, to try to figure out what the American war plans were, analyze it, and then send them up through the network. Okay, send them up through the, through the network. And so here, you, again, here's American, again, he takes us out of the coffin. Um, field force Vietnam. This is important stuff. This is the order of battle, where US troops were, where they were deployed in different areas. All right. So, you know, uh, again, he, he, he had access to all of this. Here's, a, here's the, uh, the order of battle, a whole map of Vietnam showing this the, the, the troop strength uh, during this period. Again, they're more confidential because on hand, right? But today they're all, I've, I've done this. I've looked up these documents. And of course, now they all say declassified, right? But these are the original ones that were confidential that, you know, on never gave to the National you know, Archives, right? So no one ever declassified these documents. One of the interesting things is several of these documents have certain, like page 11, let's say, if you go to the National Archives, you go to Texas Tech, not on page 11 or 10, eight lines are blocked out. They're blacked out with name, because of names or security, but ONS have no blackouts, right? So I was actually able to see what was blocked out. And again, those of you, you don't know this, but if you just you have spare time after your term papers are done, you can Google my lawsuit against the CIA, for the, uh, which is uh, which, uh, which is Berman versus, versus the CIA, um, you know, which dealt with the crown jewel of intelligence, um, uh, 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 which are these morning intelligence reports that the president always receives. And I finally lost in, in, in the California Court of Appeals, the Ninth District Court of Appeals, but which soon opened up the door for other historians to have access to this, this material. Here's Ann's note, someone's notes um, over these uh, bi-weekly uh, uh, reports in 1969. So again, uh, Ann was sharing all this stuff with me and uh, and you can see how, whoops, I did it again. I, I didn't go back. Uh, you can see how frail he is um, here compared to some of the other pictures. He's clearly not well. But because he thinks he's going to die, he's opening up. He wants a story to be told. You know, everyone, I think, reaches this point in their life. You know, if you know your time is really limited, you know, and you've lived a life that you think is worth recording, you're going you're gonna to tell that, you're going to tell, them, tell that, that story. And, uh, uh, so how did all this happen, right? And then we'll get into uh, th th those, 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 the Tet Offensive and the, the final days. So the decision is made to send them to California to study at Orange Coast College. And his mission is not to be a spy. He's going to be somewhere in your Columbia education. You've obviously read or you've heard of uh, Alexander de Tocqueville, Democracy in America, de, de Tocqueville of French and then is sent to America to learn about the attitudes of the American people, the values. And he wrote a classic, a classic that I had to read in my very first graduate seminar at Princeton uh, in, in American politics, uh, uh, Democracy in America, which even today uh, merits, merits reading. But the Tocqueville came to study the attitude of the American people, who they were, what they stood for, what they represented. Well, Ahn's mission was the same. He was, and he was originally sent there for six years. Six years was to be his mission. Uh, that the war would have something to do with this. So very early on is sponsored. Yes, you know, a Vietnamese kid and a college student in 1957 uh, or in 56, because they planned it for a year and they sent him in 57. You know, you just don't like fill out a visa and go to Vietnam, uh, go to the United States. You've got to get sponsored, right? So the irony of this whole thing is that the CIA, now again, in 19, the French have been defeated at the MBN Fu in 1954, right? So the French are defeated. And who's going to fill in that vacuum? Well, of course, you know, the Americans are the perfect country that always can determine the better future for a country, right? So first we send our spooks in. And the lead spook is this guy, the head of the, who is uh, Colonel Edward Lansdale, right? He's working for the CIA. He's got the cover of of the head of the US mission in Vietnam. Uh, and he's there, you know, along with his cohort of early spooks to, uh, to, to, to basically begin the American presence. There's no troops there yet. There's no American war, but we helped create President CM in South Vietnam, right? We, uh, uh, the Bank of Vietnam is created, right? And now our hand is in there, right? We've got the money, we've got the guy, right? And 
uh, uh, on in those earlier pictures I showed you, uh, he had been assigned uh, to work with Lansdale and uh, Conan. As, well, I, I won't mention the Conan, you know, taking off on a diversion. But Lansdale really loves on. He thinks this kid is amazing. He speaks English. He's got a great fluency. He's really bright. I'm going to sponsor him and send him to the United States. And we're going to get the Asia Foundation, which was another CIA front, to sponsor him and pay, meaning they're going to pay for the whole trip. All right. So isn't it ironic that the first Vietnamese American to arrive in California in 1957 in Southern California, in, which is today the largest home for the Vietnamese American overseas population. But back in 1957, the first Vietnamese American to arrive is a communist agent sponsored by the CIA, right? Uh, which is why many years later, people always thought that on the only reason he could have survived is because the only reason he could have survived, they said, was he had to be protected by the CIA. I just reject that. I just don't think that's possible. And uh, uh, I think th that these, these are separated by many, 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 many years. So on gets to California, and again, he's, He's on his mission. So I'm just gonna breeze through there. He just, he just, uh, he just uh, falls in love with America. He, he, uh, he's studying journalism. Uh, he, he hung out in the beaches. If you had not been to Southern California in this area, it's really the most, one of the most beautiful Newport Beach, one of the most beautiful areas of the country. He became something of a rock star in Orange Coast College because he was the first Vietnamese and people didn't even know about Vietnam, right? They thought it was part of cold China, right? They gave him a nickname uh, uh, that was derogatory in a way today, uh, but uh, they called him Confucius, right? And um, they, uh, uh, and, but there were stories written about him, right? And again, the public persona, right? And uh, this is the newspaper uh, article about that. He loves sailing, there he is with those cigarettes that he, uh, almost every picture you'll sit around. There he is at night sitting at his desk in his dorm room, listening to the uh, American uh, hi fi, listening to B. He told me he listened to BBC. He's got the Webster's Dictionary uh, on his desk. Uh, this is one of my favorite photographs that you can see. He's uh, on his circle up there in the middle on the right. Uh, this is, and there's my California Aggies up on the top. But this is an all university faculty uh, student conference. And there's on wearing his Vietnamese. Uh, uh, a, a tire, there is a point here, but I can't see, but it's circled in green about uh, four rows up from the, five rows up from the front and right and uh, uh, on, on the right. Uh, and then he gets to go to Sacramento and he's photographed in this picture with the governor of California, Governor Edmund G. Brown. And Governor Brown describes him as the most promising Vietnamese journalist in its training and studying in the United States. All right. So, Again, he's fully, uh, uh, it, it, he, wrote, he wrote for the uh, student newspaper called The Barnacle. So he reviews um, uh, The Quiet American, which is a really difficult, imagine he's a, he's a communist agent undercover and he's asked to review um, uh, 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 The Quiet American. And he's very delicate uh, how, he, how, he, how he deals with this. Uh, I'll just skip over, uh, skip over this. Uh, and, but he learned his profession. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, but the other thing that happened again, think of Alexander de Tocqueville in this sense, he loved being in America. He learned about the spontaneity of the American people. He loved, he, he believed in the freedom of the press. He had never studied journalism like this and he wanted to bring it back to Vietnam. And this is all before the American war. So he's there from 57 to 59. There's no American true presence yet. Right there's 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 just the advisors, but inside of Vietnam there's a big crackdown going on. Xiam is cracking down on political opponents, and uh, he receives a secret coded message that he's supposed to come home, that his mission's over, and he had two choices. One was to stay in the United States. He could have just stayed, given up the revolution. Uh, the Asia Foundation offered him a job at a really good salary as a translator, uh, uh, or he could return to Vietnam. And this is why An always thought his story was, was valuable for the young people of Vietnam, because he had given his word to return. 
his loyalty was to his country and that he couldn't stay. It would be selfish. Uh, so before he left, he pinned up, he, he wrote a couple of editorials and uh, uh, describes how he felt about living with them. He felt like he was living among the Vietnamese. He didn't spend a single weekend in the door. It was a commuter college. He was always invited to someone's home over the weekend. And people love to have him there. And I tell some of those stories uh, uh, in, in the chapter you weren't, 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 weren't assigned. And, uh, uh, and I love these quotes right here. Um, and he never, he, these were embedded in his heart. Uh, and again, when he went back, he always thought he would see these people again he didn't know about the American war. He didn't know that the Americans, the Americans uh, were, were, were coming. And, uh, uh, and before he left, they gave him this, uh, they gave him this uh, uh, mug, which you'll see it momentarily. He, he bought this car for 300 bucks, I think. And he got this California driver's license. And he drove, uh, he got, had all these maps. He showed me that he still saved them all. And, uh, and then the Sacramento Bee publishes an article about him. His cover is totally intact. Vietnam journalist aims to fight red propaganda, right? So he's, this is a feature in the Sacramento Bee newspaper um, where he was interning. So uh, as far as anyone was concerned, he had succeeded in creating this cover, which is why no one had any doubt when he came back, uh, he was easily able to, to, fit, to, fit, to fit right in. He interned in the United Nations. Uh, he then got, ended up working for Reuters whole series of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of newspapers in Vietnam. Uh, and then comes the American War. So what's ha what does An do? So An's mission now that he's back is to report on the strategic intelligence of what the Americans are doing. And his very first medal that he won't find out that he was awarded until many years later came in 1962 for Op Bach. Uh, uh, which occurred in January, sorry, January 1963, not 1962. And that was the very first, the first example where John Paul Van had hoped to prove how these Arvin troops that he had been training could hold up against the, uh, the, the defeat, uh, the defeat, the guerrillas uh, with the support of American helicopters and artillery. Um, and uh, it was a debacle, 15 helicopters were killed were, were down uh, and uh, and then and was, no one was captured and uh, there were American deaths and or, or, or there were North Vietnamese deaths and uh, uh, and these were the pictures that occurred in the New York Times and it was the very first hint uh, that the vulnerability of Arvin and the vulnerability of the American uh, intervention that was 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 to come and. Uh, and almost all the press stories, people were saying they must have known something, and little did they know that those reports had come uh, from from on, who had analyzed the counterinsurgency documents and sent them up to Hanoi with a suggestion on how to fight, and they picked the place of uh, Opdok. Uh, he also wrote a report on that the Americans were coming. You know, again, no one could believe in 1963 or 64 that the Americans would one day invest 585,000 troops just for a stalemate? I mean, how far was America willing to go with bombing and, and the use of chemical weapons and the like? Well, Ant report said they're coming uh, and they're coming uh, in July, they're coming full force. And uh, that was when the 125,000, 150,000 American troops were, were sent in. Uh, you've read about the Tet Offensive in 1968. In 19, uh, so that was the first time and the only time that the North Vietnamese sent down to uh, an agent, to Khan, to, to case out the place with An. And imagine what it must have been like for An. Here's the guy who was sent up reports, is also working with Tu Khan, but he's also going to be responsible for reporting for Time Magazine what's going on. And he has to be careful to balance it all. He can't give any hint that he knows that the invasion's coming. And he also... Uh, has to be astute enough to be able to tell Tukang, well, the way to get our troops in, or you, know, you might want to leave uh, uh, our artillery there or there and the like. So those reports were really instrumental. And after the attack, after the attack, uh, on as you read, is going all over with uh, with uh, 
a chaplain, uh, and he's explained to Chaplin how the Viet Cong were able to do it. And here's Chaplin, the most astute of all America, of, of all the reporters, and he had no idea he was actually being briefed by the guy who helped plan the attack. Uh, I mean, again, uh, that's why I call him the perfect spy. I just don't know what else to uh, to to to, to, uh, to call him. But he would on would receive his export medal, not for necessarily for the reports he gave to Khan. We got it because after Ted, it was a defeat for the North Vietnamese, right? I mean, uh, uh, that's how they looked at it. They thought they had been defeated. They hadn't gotten into the embassy really. They hadn't, there had been no uprising. And uh, it looked to the North Vietnamese who had planned it, that the mission had failed. But An, whose pulse was right on this thing, said, no, 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 it was a great victory. Have you read the U.S. papers? Are you, are you reading, listening to the teletypes? Have you heard of Walter Cronkite? You know, all this stuff was coming out. It's a stalemate. It's over. Uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 calls for uh, if say, Saigon is not secure, what is secure? And it was An's report back that kept the North Vietnamese uh, involved in, at the level they were in, and it changed their attitude. That's certainly been verified uh, 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 now. And uh, uh, and of course, uh, the Tet Offensive, the communist losses in the first and second one were so great that, and then the Paris, we're gonna fast forward here, that then we go to the Easter Offensive of 1972, where their, their losses are also very great, uh, but they've also left a lot of troops in the South in preparation for the signing of the Paris Accords, which would be in April 30th, 1973. Um, uh, uh, the, uh, I want to make sure I get the sequencing right, which is they were so depleted in the North that they were thinking that they really couldn't unify the country to 1977, 1978. But it was Ahn's reports of the US Congress, the anti-war Congress that was brought in in 1974 and American public opinion. It was Ahn's reports that say that the Americans are never coming back and that you should speed up the unification of our country. And you could speed it up till like 1974, 1975. And that decision is made based in part from Ahn's reports that are coming up. So rather than wait, wait until 1978 or so when their forces were, were re-energized and, and uh, they moved it up and the country is unified on April 30th, 1975. Uh, That's a picture of Ahn just a few days uh, later. Um, so I'm, again, I'm going to skip over this, but as you know, there are so many things that we have to figure out about Ahn. One is the lives he saved. You did read the Robert Anson story in chapter one, so I'm not going to go over, over that. But why would he risk everything, everything to save that man? His entire cover, everything I've been talking about, he risked to save an American reporter. Why would he do that? Right? So, you know, Ahn had an answer while well, we were friends, right? So, you know, I mean, that, that's one explanation, right? But then the saving of Dr. Trien, who you read about in chapter uh, six, and I reread last night, and I've forgotten some of the details of that. That's even more extraordinary. This man was on the, he was the leading anti-communist in the regime. Then he got into trouble because he opposed President Win Van Tu, and he and his, a lot of his cadres were in a lot of trouble. But why would Ahn risk everything to save that man? Right? Why would he do that? Because he got in a lot of trouble for saving that man. Did Dr. Twin know a lot of his secrets? Uh, had they both been protecting each other for all those years? We still don't know the answer to that. But we do know that on the last helicopter that left that, that area, the last guy on, after Tran Van Don, what, what, was, uh, what, was Dr. Twin. And again, you've read that. So I hope you have some questions about, about that. And there's Dr. Twin at a younger, a younger, younger time. And then why would he evacuate his family to the US? On sends his family, entire family to the United States. You know, why did Nan go with them? Right? A lot of discussion we now know in Hanoi was centered on, on whether or not An should go. He decided not to send him, but his family went. And uh, uh, and then comes this period of the lost revolution. So uh, here's my theory. An did not leave Vietnam in April 30th, 1975, because 
In his own mind, he believed that his whole life's vision of a unified Vietnam, free of foreign aggressors, the French, the Japanese, and now the Americans. And finally, Vietnam would be free to determine its own future. And he wanted to play a role in that. He wanted to play a role in that because he understood that this American values that he had been exposed to and he had worked with this enemy for so long, they weren't really the enemy. The American, when he drove across the country, he was only treated with goodness and kindness by the American people. They took him into his home. He lived with Americans. He saw that governments waged wars, but that the people, there was no fundamental difference between Vietnamese and Americans with respect to the things that they valued about self-dignity and freedom and, and the like. They were all aspiring for the same thing. And An thought he could be a part of that. Well, he got a rude awakening, of course, because the new regime in the North, first of all, questioned him about why he had saved Dr. Twin. That's number one, okay? Uh, and he was interrogated for that. Then he was sent to a modified re-education where he had to read for a, year, for a year and a half, he had to go to Hanoi. And he went to a political institute where he was forced to be trained in Marxist uh, economics. And An said to them, it's too late, I've already, no, it doesn't work. Um, and uh, uh, I've, I've lived in America, you know, I know this capitalistic system, they're a benefit. Well, every time he opened his mouth, he got in trouble, right? So then he was sent back to Saigon and he was put under house arrest for several years, no visitors, nothing. And again, this is in, in, in the book, but, uh, and then with the beginning of Des Moines, all, everyone comes back to see him and he's allowed to see them. That's Bob Chaplin, you know, who he's whispering into his ear. All these people, and again, I ask you, in your own personal experiences with your own friends, how can a, can a spy have real friends? Can a spy have true friends? Imagine if the person, your best friend, who you've known for 10 years, if you found out tomorrow that person was really a Russian agent or a Cuban agent or whatever, would you still feel as close to that person as, as, as they felt to us? Or would you feel that somehow your friendship had been taken advantage of, that, he, that, 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 that you had been betrayed? I can't answer that for any of you. I, I've dealt with this for two decades. It's a really difficult question. I'm writing an essay right now, can a, a spy have real friends? And you know, I, I mean, it's a schizophrenic essay about, you know, about how people would react. That Stanley Cloud came back. Everyone wanted to go see him and talk to him about, and this was the most interesting. That's William Colby, who was station chief in Vietnam in 1959, the CIA station chief. He came back to Vietnam and he wanted to talk to Ahn. He did about how you did it. And I asked him, well, why did you say it? He said, I can't tell you. That's one of the areas where, you know, I'm not going to tell you what we, we discussed. Um, and uh, uh, other people came back to, uh, to, to see Ahn. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then in the greatest irony of all, those of you, it is in the, chat, in the last chapter, which I don't think was a sign, his son was known as Young On or Little On. All the American journalists raced. On wanted his oldest son to be educated in the United States. And he was sent first to Columbia um, and, uh, uh, and then to Duke, Duke and then Columbia. Sorry, I got, got, got wrong. Duke, you know, no, Columbia and then, then Duke. Is it Duke? Which, which is the order? Right, he went to Duke first, and then he, he came here and studied journalism at, the, at, the, at Columbia. $30,000 was raised by all of An's former friends. Uh, they paid his way because An wanted his son to have the same experience and exposure to Americans that he had had. And of course, the great irony in all this is that young An becomes the interpreter for President Bush's visit. This is only one of three visits. So here you have the firstborn son of the most strategic, successful, heralded spy of the war, now interpreting for President Bush uh, uh, during his visit. And there are several other pictures that I didn't include for other presidents. And in Washington, D.C., uh, he was at the, uh, a young guy was at the Willard Hotel. I was living in Washington at the time, it was the University of Washington, UC, the UC Center. And he calls me up and he goes, come see me at the Willard, Larry. President Bush just gave me, a, like to give people nicknames. I got a nickname, I'm in. And, uh, uh, but there he is. And, and, uh, and uh, uh, you couldn't make this up. How is it possible, uh, this life uh, on? And there's President Bush and there's on, young on all the way to the, uh, on, the on the right during, a, during another, another visit. Um, and, you know, I begin the story in chapter one with this, with this which is, you know, on, on became a symbol of reconciliation. 
He used, we, as soon as the Americans started coming back, he became he befriended almost everyone in the U.S. consulate and the American embassy, and they came to really respect him for the fact that his dream was a, was a world in which the Vietnamese and Americans could be stronger together and work together, uh, uh, blending the strengths of each, and just always remembering that it was the governments that had waged this war, not the people. The very first ship that ever came into Saigon after the war was the USS Vandegrift. And the Vandegrift was in Saigon Harbor, and the VIP guest was Pham Soon An. That's the, in the middle, that's uh, Emily Yamaguchi, who's the US Consul General. That's, uh, that's uh, uh, Captain Rogers, uh, uh, who was the captain of the vessel. And that's his son, Young An. And I always tell my students, I ran an intern program, I don't know who that guy is because he's an intern, but if you're an intern, always get in a picture because uh, you never know. You could live for immortality in Berman's presentations or anyone else. So I don't know who that guy is, but he was an intern. Um, and uh, he, did, he did a good job. Uh, but, uh, and, I, and I tried to take him off, but then you end up with one of those, it just didn't, <laughs> it just didn't, uh, it's, it just didn't work. So, uh, uh, but there's on, on the ship. How is it possible that the guy I've been talking to all, all along becomes not only the key part of a reconciliation, but the VIP guest of the, of the Consul General? And there's a very funny scene in which a Vietnamese uh, a colonel comes, he's dressed in his, all of his full military regalia, and he comes over and he says, are you from Sunan in, in Vietnamese? And I says, yes, I am, because An is just dressed in civilian attire. And the general says to him, looking around, seeing all the Americans, which side? were you on? And An's answer was both sides. Um, and the guy was startled and An just laughed and broke into a smile and he said, just kidding, just kidding. You know, I was on your side. Uh, and then An told me, that when he gave me that picture, he goes, that's why that they will never let me out. He, would ne he was never allowed to leave Vietnam. Uh, uh, that's why they will never let me out because they still don't know who I really am, right? And uh, and uh, when he died, he, he had specifically asked not to have a state funeral, but he got one. Um, and there it is, in his journey for the next life, in his home, these are all the things that his family thought he would need. So he's got the food, the nourishment for, you know, for, for the next for his journey. And then he's got the medals, the picture of him. And right up front is that picture from Orange Coast College of a mug that had been given to him as a gift from his friends. So he was a man who lived the duality of the American experience uh, who became a spy, never really wanted to be a spy, but became, became a spy out of a sense of nationalism to rid his country of aggressors, foreign aggressors. But that once those aggressors left, and they did in April, 1975, there would be a kumbaya moment in which uh, everyone would realize we can now determine our own future. And as you've been reading in your syllabus and the like, and I think next week's conversation is, is a topic as well. You know, after the war for, 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 for Viet, a united Vietnam, but there was the victors, and then there were the ones who sided with the Americans. And it was a period of retribution, of punishment. Uh, it was a period of, of really terrible things that it would, until Vietnam realized that uh, there was, until they opened up economically with the more. You know, there's still no freedom of the press the way we would talk or the way that I'm dreamed, right? The, my own censorship would explain that. Uh, but he would be very happy with, for example, when Tommy Vallow is here next week or in two weeks, he would be beaming that there was something called Fulbright University in Vietnam, all right? And that that university was educating Vietnamese in a liberal arts tradition, right? That is what I believed. Uh, that is what he fought the revolution for. That's why he joined the revolution. That's what he had lived his life for. You know, so the life of the spy is one thing, but the arc of his life. And there are so many things I can't explain. And I do believe that 20 years from today, 30 years from today, maybe 50 years today, maybe one of your daughters will be a historian and they can finally go in. And I hope the North, uh, that Vietnam opens up the archives where all of Han's reports, hundreds of reports are available but are locked up that no one can see today. I tried, I wasn't allowed, but no one can get in. But eventually I think we will be open. Then we'll have the full story of the strategic side. And when he died, 
just look at these messages. This came from the Fulbright's economics teaching. Uh, uh, this came from Harvard. Uh, uh, I can mention Harvard here, right? Yeah. Um, for a beloved teacher of Song Sunan, we will always cherish your wisdom and friendship. This guy was a spy, right? I keep reminding you because of, of, of the, the art. In admiration and loving memory of Fam Sunan from the she Neil Sheehan family. Um, and here I am uh, going to visit on where he's buried. Uh, he wanted to be buried elsewhere, but he's buried with all the other famous spies of the war. And he's and I'm, I'm about to leave that book and lighting a jaw stick in his memory. And I had a lot of private words for him because I really do believe he was on that, that journey. And he's surrounded by the symbols of his life. Uh, which are dogs, and which are the symbols of a spy as well, but uh, and but also of a human being. And think about these, I think it gives you a lot to think about. A dog, because as I always said, no matter how poor you are, no matter how bad things are for you, a dog will always remain loyal. Loyalty, right? Uh, loyalty. Fish, there's a fish. Uh, uh, yeah, you can see it, the fish at the bottom right there. Fish, because fish never speak, all right? and birds. And remember what he wrote in Orange Coast College uh, in, the, uh, in his op-ed, where he said he dreamed of being a swallow, being able to fly back to, to, to Orange Coast College, to be back in America. Well, he always, uh, birds, because birds were free, free to fly anywhere. So that in many ways encapsulates uh, his personality, his view, his view of the world. And so I'm still trying to figure him out, but that's, uh, that's it, and uh, I went a little long, but hopefully it was worth it to you. I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we'll begin the Q&A part of the event, and I will take care of any questions that we have online, but we'll open it up to uh, folks here first. <laughs> Don't be modest. Don't be modest. Yeah, especially the. I have five other pages of lecture notes. <laughs> I never looked at my notes once, and now I can look and see what I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, I I have kind of an abstract question. Yeah. You were just saying that um, you're still trying to figure out on, and uh, earlier in your lecture, you said that when people are uh, nearing death a lot of times if they think they've had a life that was interesting or worth retelling that they want to tell people about it um my question is given the nature of of on's life and um the secrets that he must have kept do you think that he was telling you everything do you think that there's things that he really did like take to his grave that not many people knew about what he was doing yeah, that, that's a great question. And if you're a professor to sign the entire book, uh, you would know the answer to that because I do address it. It's a great question. The answer is no, I think An took most of his real secrets with him. He only, so one of the criticisms of my book has been, not it, so the book is, of me has been that if An was such a master at spinning people, how do I know I wasn't the last person that he spun, right? How, how do I know I wasn't the last victim of the master spin? manipulator, the master spin. So the answer is, I did, as a historian, I did the best I could. I left a lot of things out of this book because I couldn't verify them. I worked in five or six different archives. Uh, I tracked down, I interviewed you know, uh, 50 or 60 people. I, I, I did the best I could. And that's why my book is more about, about the persona than the espionage. Because to be quite honest, uh, no one can write that book now. There's another really good book about On, but written by Thomas Bass. Uh, uh, the two of us, we really can't address uh, that the issue that you're asking about. That's why I say historians 50 years from now, hopefully we'll be able to do that. So I've never made a claim that uh, uh, On uh, revealed to me any real secrets that he didn't want to reveal. And there were things I left out of the book, and there were things that he told me I could not put in the book until after his death. And so he, he died a year before this book was published. So when the Vietnam, there's not been a second edition, there won't be a second edition, but in the Vietnamese edition, I did write a new afterward or forward where I did include 
about four or five things that Anna told me I couldn't include until after his death. And one of them was about Anna's, uh, the details of An's role in Lamsum uh, 719 in 1971. But still, that book can't be written yet. Great question. Yeah, there's someone right next to you. Yeah, we'll we'll get um, to your question too. But yeah, I see this. Thanks so much for being here today. This has been such a wonderful talk. My um, question is kind of about um, some of the thematic contextualizing that you do early in the book. You seem concerned with um, how Zwan contextualizes his own, you know, morality and ideas about loyalty. And I was wondering if you could kind of um, maybe get into some of the conclusions that you arrive at regarding morality and how he kind of lives with his own, um, you know, multiple loyalties. Yeah, wow, that's a great question. And again, if I had had enough sense to look at my notes, I would have remembered to address one of those parts, but I'll, I can do the com completely now. Really good, I'm glad you asked that. So on, would, there's several examples of this. So on always insisted, that he loved America, loved Americans, and that he was responsible for no deaths of Americans. That was something that he really grappled with, but that's not true. His reports were responsible for the death of lots of Americans, not only in Tet, in Tet but elsewhere, right? And you just can't be impartial on that. And Ahn really struggled, especially in our interviews that were all recorded and are available on, in digitized form. Uh, Ahn struggled with that and uh, 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 all the time because he, he, I think he actually found it unbearable to consider the consequences of what he did. Um, and uh, that's serious because he, in his own world, you know, he just wanted everyone to come together, right? But, there were the, but it turned out that part of his world led to death and destruction. And that was a big thing that he had to grapple with, right? The other thing that he always grappled with uh, 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 privately, I think, um, was, uh, and again, this is heavy psychological stuff, which is, I'm just going to put it out there. I want to read something to you. Uh, so when you live a cover for so long, like he did, where you fully immerse yourself in someone else's, in a personality, in a cover, and then one day someone comes along and just snaps their finger and says, as they did in 1975, okay, War's over. You don't have to be that guy anymore. You can be your old self. I don't think An knew who his old self was. Okay. I think that he actually liked, he loved living the cover so much that that's who he wanted his new self to be. But he couldn't do that in New Vietnam uh, for a long time. And it, and, and it wasn't until the beginning of diplomatic relations and the opening up of Vietnam where he was allowed to become whole again, so to speak. And uh, so there was a there was a book published in 1983, it's in Vietnamese, uh, and uh, it's called uh, Past Continuous, written by a very well-known writer whose name is Win Kai. Um, and uh, 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 it's a novel, but it's, it, it's a novel studying three revolutionaries, but the revolutionaries were real people who told him, who told Win Kai about their life and what they had done during the war. So again, this was published in 83. So only eight years after unification, right? Two years before the opening of diplomatic relations. And uh, there's a character in there whose name is Quan. And Quan is Pham Sunan. And when I didn't know anything about this until on in one of our later visits said, you really want to understand me? Read this book or have someone translate this book for you. And uh, I'm going to read to you. There is. It turned out there is an English version. You can buy it at Amazon or on Amazon or wherever. But and I know the people who are writing the script or uh, the film are really focused on this book because they think Win Kai comes closer to anyone to dealing with this question of grappling. I'm just going to read to you right now. This is how Quan is described to the Vietnamese people in 1983. Quan was a veteran of two wars of liberation. But for, the entire, but for the entire 30 years of his military service, he had never seen his own comrades' faces, only the faces of the enemy. He had been friends or acquaintances with many of the American advisors, 
and high-ranking officers of the Saigon government from I Corps to Four Corps. He knew officers of the special force, officers of the special forces, and from the top secret elite units of MACV general staff. He had been a special kind of soldier on a special kind of battlefield, isolated from his comrades, living with his enemies, breathing the same air, knowing that one who looked at him as a close friend today could tomorrow be his torturer. Every action, even the most minute, had to be seen in, seen in terms of its service to his mission. He had to live his cover as if it was his real life, in his thoughts as well as in his actions. He had to become his mask, only his mask, always his mask, nothing else. Fake, but real, real but fake, for days and months and years. And at times when it seemed the war was getting bigger and fiercer, it felt as if he would live like that forever. But when the war was over, just like that, he had to return and live in ordinary people, as ordinary people live. Until then, he had buried himself in a false life, lived the existence of a persons he had created in order to fulfill his duty. How was he now find his true personality? He couldn't continue to live the life he had lived for 30 years, and yet who was he before that time? Did that man still exist? Whenever I observed him in a new situ social situation, he seemed tentative, groping for the right words, somewhat shy and clumsy. When we spoke, he would always preclude his sentences with tentative disclaimers like, quote, in my way of thinking, perhaps, or in my experience, I think that. Yet none of his opinions that followed were at all mundane, mundane or banal. They were always sharp, made a significant contribution to whatever was, was being discussed. Juan had been an agent for 30 years and had formed relationships within the top echelon of the Saigon regime. Yet his true allegiance had never even been suspected. He had developed many ways to double check and triple check his sources and agents in order to keep himself alive. But as I listened, I could hear all that had been lost to him as well. And I don't know, I'd share that with you because 1983, and An wanted me to read this book, and this is it. I really do think that was the, that was what you were asking. Uh, this is a good summary of that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, this is just a detail. You said there was a cemetery in uh, Vietnam just for spies. Yes. Who supports that and where is it? Oh, it's it's in well, that's it that 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 cemetery is in, is in Saigon. There's also one in Hanoi. Uh and it's got when I say a cemetery, all for spies, it's a military cemetery. So it's military and then they have a wing for all the spies. Some very famous spies are in there. Yeah. And so it's, well, it's the government. It's the government. It's all government. Thank you so much again for coming today. I've really enjoyed listening to you talk. Um, so you mentioned this earlier, and you also mentioned it kind of throughout um, your talking, but I was curious to know about, you mentioned that you received some criticism for distinguishing him as a nationalist versus a communist and i would just like to hear about some of those criticisms that yeah. you received and why you received them and who who were they from things like that yeah sure and you can go online they're all online and i can give you i should have put my i think my website was there but it's just larryberman.net and you can go and read some of them on at the, at the perfect spy apart yeah so uh there were two types of criticism one was the criticism that came from uh from um, usually um, right-wing um, uh, sources that I, I, I welcomed. I actually engaged several written exchanges, which said that it's easy to call someone a nationalist, but the real consequence of what An did was that he basically turned the country, once known as South Vietnam, he helped to enslave millions and millions of people. And that therefore, he was, there was no difference between what he did and what hardcore Stalinist communist would want to do, which is basically control the, the, the society and the mind of people, and that on, on, on played a role in that, and that I should have dealt with that in the book. And, uh, and that's something I hear even uh, today, which I still speak on the book by, by people who feel that uh, 
the blood on his hands is so great that uh, uh, I'm too nice to him, too kind. That is almost I'm 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 uh, I'm in awe of him. And I, obviously, when I spoke today, a lot of you would have the right to say, "Well, it sounds like Berman really liked this guy." And the truth is, is that that's true. And you know, it, it's difficult for a historian to write a book about someone who's living. It's pretty easy to write a book about, you know, someone who's uh, who's uh, long dead, thirty or forty years. But I, I, I became intrigued by it, and I, I did, I, I, and also I agreed with him. See, that's the other criticism. Berman writes um, as if he's a member of the front. You know, I mean that uh, that he sees the struggle as on saw it, and as the anti-war movement saw it. I can't disavow that. You know, uh, but I shared On's vision of what a what a what a unified v Vietnam is about, and uh, and then there's the criticism that I was the uh, uh, just another you know another example of a of a of a historian who um, who uh, uh, um, got taken in by On okay? that uh, that that I didn't tell the rest of the story, and all I can do on that is say that you all will face this at some time in your life. You do the best you can with what you got. Uh, now this book was written you know, a long time ago now. I wish I could rewrite it uh, today. I've learned so much more. And uh, and I, I think I would step back a little more and be a little more analytical in certain areas. Uh, but uh, I became personally fascinated by the trip to California and the influence of that on his life. And there's so much I didn't go into about that, but those lifetime uh, relationships. And... Uh, and and you know he became, he was, he remained an, an American file, an Anglophile his whole life. You know it's just the way way it was, and this in many ways makes him a very unique uh, individual uh, in 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 history. And I will say that at the end of the war on April on May first, nineteen uh, May first, nineteen seventy five, of every Vietnamese in Vietnam, the one who knew the Americans the best was on, and that was his undoing, right. And I was intrigued by that as well. Right, so that's the best I can do with that. Um, hi. Um, I'm doing research for my term paper on South Vietnamese journalism. And I was just on journalists. I was just wondering if you could say a bit more about his relationship with the American journalists or his experience as a journalist in South Vietnam, obviously shaped by the fact that he was a spy. But yeah. I'm glad you asked that question because, again, in a chapter that I don't think was assigned. When An came back from America in 59, uh, Dr. Twin actually hired him to uh, be, uh, to work for something known as Vietnam Press. And An's job was to train Vietnamese journalists on what he had learned in America. And An couldn't do it because he said, I'm going to lose my red card uh, because uh, how can I teach them about a free press and all these other things that we that I learned about in, in, in Orange, Orange Coast. He found it very, very difficult uh, to do because he was, he was, he was hindered. Uh, with the Americans, you know, on traded on information. Uh, this is the interpersonal side of what he, he believed. He, his contacts were so deep. And so you know, new reporters, when they came to Vietnam, uh, uh, they don't, the, the, the senior people almost always told them, go talk to An. An will explain this to you. Again, the Anson chapter is really good on that. Because I, well, it's an example, uh, but Anson wasn't alone. There were lots of, of, of reporters like that, and he was respected. If you look at David Halberstam's The Best and the Brightest, he talks about An, Neil Sheehan, uh, Bright Shining Live, um, uh, uh, yeah, Chaplin, uh, several, of, several of his books, and Stanley Carnow. Uh, all of them talk about how invaluable An was and how objective he was. And that's the other thing. I deal with this in the book. I don't know if it was a sign. It probably is to an earlier question as well. So time was very embarrassed. When, when An's real identity was disclosed, time was initially very embarrassed. And they did an internal study of everything he had ever written every, or contributed to, hundreds of articles, uh, because there was a conservative outlet called Media Watch or something like that. And they actually would let an Arnold Borga, Borshagov, uh, uh, Portia Gavin, another uh, someone uh, said that An's reporting had slanted uh, 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 Times reporting, the New York Herald Tribune's reporting, and there were congressional hearings on this. And you, you could never find anything that substantiated that. Because, as again, as I just read here, he immersed himself so much in his cover 
that he became in his cover an objective South Vietnamese reporter for Time magazine. But I'm criticized that all, all the time, nevertheless, but does it, what a facts matter, right? And um, the other criticism that's often leveled on me and also the media in general is, well, of course they turned him into a spy because what better place for a communist agent to be than the liberal media, right? So that's the one place he would never be uncovered because everyone thinks like him anyway. Um, and so I get that argument even today, okay? That, you know, they say, sure, of course he became a media, the place where communists thrive, right? So you know how that works. I mean, I don't have to take you through that. And it's such a simplistic uh, argument, but it doesn't stop people from raising it. Yes, oh, there are two questions here, great. Uh, yeah. Um... Once again, thank you for coming in and, and speaking to us. I really appreciate it. And I thought the presentation was really fascinating and interesting. Uh, and he seemed like a fantastic, fantastic person. Um, my question is about an excerpt in, I believe it was chapter six, where on kind of uh, laments the fact that Americans didn't do enough to kind of raise the next generation of leaders in yes. South Vietnam. Um, that I thought was really an interesting piece. And I think went to, went to uh, showed a lot about his own character. Just hoping that you know if that was a genuine feeling of his and not just a, you know part of his cover story if you could just kind of expand on that and his ideas about what americans should be doing in south vietnam yeah so, uh, so a great question absolutely so there's a book by uh, a friend of your professor of my is not recently deceased his name is bui ziem uh uh uh, uh and uh, he wrote a book called the jaws of defeat right yeah the jaws of defeat and Bui uh, lays out in that book, um, he was the former uh, South Vietnamese ambassador to the United States and just passed away and lived a great life in his 90s, um, played tennis up until last two years ago and just a wonderful person. Uh, he, uh, uh, he I, I showed on that book and I had already was familiar with it in which he, which, which uh, Bui's main criticism of, 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 of Vietnamese is that there had been no new leadership cadre that uh, at all. And on then just started talking about that. And he referred often to this, and I this is in the book too. And it's a quote that he told Chaplin, and it's a quote that he told me. And he didn't know I had read it in Chaplin. So I believe that he did it's true, which is that uh, 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 President Tu and his government were like a, a trained opium addicted uh, opium addicted uh, monkeys in a in a in a carnival, and the way you train them is that you keep giving them them opium to 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 dance and and to to as a circus animal to dance and to 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 do the tricks that you want them to do, and through operant reinforcement you can eventually train them to do whatever you want. But then when you remove the opium. They go back to eating their own excrement, right? So An equated that to President Tu and USAID. That is, as long as we gave aid to Tu and all that money, right? He did. He he clicked his heels and he did what we wanted. But once that aid was withdrawn, they had nothing. Okay, because while they built schools and highways and the like, they 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 didn't train teachers. They didn't do those things that were necessary, and and we didn't train young leaders uh, who could have challenged to. So instead, as you know from your reading, President Tu ran, we were fighting for democracy, right? But in 1971, he ran unopposed in an election uh, uh, in which An convinced the only remaining candidate, Tran Van Don, to withdraw. Um, and uh, and so, because An later said, what an embarrassment to the United States that would be to fight for democracy and have a one-man election under President Tu in 1971. So without a doubt, I mean, that's how On felt. And there was almost no emphasis. Uh, tu wouldn't have allowed any of the kind of grooming of a new leadership cadre. And, you know, which brings me to the real big question too, which is, the, and I asked On about this, it's a little off question, but which is, you know, On was very involved reporting on the coup against CM in 1963. Right. And one of the things I mentioned in the book is, so why do you think ZM was assassinated? Because eventually it would be six revolving door governments and then President Two would be installed. 
And he said, because President Tu opposed American troops turning Vietnam into a battlefield. And the American, American Tu was a client, but ZM was a client of the American system, all right? And uh, uh, you couldn't have a client saying he, he didn't want the Americans coming. Um, and so those of you writing about this period might want to just think about that as well. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I have a follow-up question about your answer to the first question that was asked. Yeah. Um, can you give us your take, I guess, on why An did not want to um, have the story about his involvement in Lam Sun 19 or that whole, 719 or that whole operation come out until after his death? I mean, why he was specifically concerned with that or the other stories that he wanted to be withheld until he died. Um, and then I'm also curious, because I unfortunately do not know Vietnamese, if you could tell us what his involvement um, in, in that like situation was? Well, yeah. So uh, again, that's a really good question. Uh, so there were a lot of things, I'll answer the first part uh, first, and I'll do the second. Uh, uh, there were a lot of things on told me that about operations that he told me I couldn't put in the book at all, but he used it to illustrate a point. Then he, there were things that he told me that I could put in the book only after he died. And I honored both of those. Um, on Lam Sum, uh, uh, specifically, which is the incursion into Laos, uh, 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 on, on revealed to me details of how he was able to confirm for his higher, for his higher, for the, for the jungle. That's what he always said to me. I have to confirm things for the jungle. Uh, 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 his modus operandi on how he got the information and specifically, what I didn't know at the time was that he had received almost all the reports from the Vietnamese Central Intelligence Organization, the Office of Intelligence, uh, on the on the operation. He was able to distill those and send them forward. You know, and uh, uh, but you know, again, uh, so I write about in my book. I write about four exploit medals. Those were the four that I knew about at the time. But since then, I've learned about. Uh, 12 others. So, so far I know about of 16 exploit medals that he's received for those, his report, 16. Uh, but uh, so I only knew about four and that's all the Vietnamese journalists ever wrote about four. And so one of the things I'm really interested in is exploring the others, which I don't know about very much uh, right now, but they're almost impossible to get that information. Even Tu Kong's pistols that he used, I get, you know this in the chapter that he used during the uh, uh, Tet Offensive. Those are, I wanted to see them. You know, and uh, Tukhan gave me permission to see them. I wanted to hold one, you know, but I mean, uh, but he wanted me, but they're locked up in a military museum and even I wasn't allowed to get access, even with a letter from Tukhan that I could uh, go see them. This was uh, fascinating, really, really enjoyed it. And good luck on the film. I hope that makes it to the screen. It'll be, be yeah, amazing. So uh, quick question on, um, when you were with him at the end. So this man gave his life, identity, family, everything to the cause to reunite the country. And then went through, you know, post decade after of being in prison, seeing the struggles that the country went through till it finally opened up. And his dream, as you said, was this reconciliation. And so much has progressed. We're not where we would all like to be. But do, do you think he died with a feeling that I help that, that we're finally realizing this dream I had to for reconciliation of these countries and 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 uh, a movement forward to come over all the death, destruction, and challenges Vietnam had experienced for decades. Yes, I I believe that when he died, he uh, he had a great deal of happiness, internal happiness, about uh, the reconciliation reconciliation process. And the fact that our two countries were uh, were working together on a whole range of issues, because back then, you know, that was the first breakthrough. I remember even talking to him about this. We were talking about American uh, uh, during times of, uh, of of national emergencies, Americans, American troops using uh, helicopter pads and things to combat terrorism, uh, uh, international narcotics. Uh, 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 the, uh, the 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 trade you know the trading of human bodies and flesh all these things he thought were, were amazing that 
our two countries were beginning these discussions uh, on. He, he remained though uh, very concerned about two things. Uh, so I don't think I've ever told anyone this in a public, an event that's being recorded, but it is, uh, it's okay uh, because, uh, uh, you know, um, as An said, I'm, what, what can they do to me? So um, uh, the, uh, so the last time I saw Farms in his life, uh, I had come to his house and I, I, this is published in the, Vietnam, in the Vietnamese edition of the second uh, printing. I went upstairs, uh, he was too weak and he only had a few days to live. I didn't know this, um, but I had been summoned to his house and I had never been allowed upstairs. I'd never been, never thought of going upstairs. He was uh, in bed, um, uh, almost like a hospice uh, situation, but no hospice, but just, he, he was very weak. And um, he told me that this would be the last time we would speak. Um, and I asked me if there was anything else um, I wanted to ask him, you know, you know and you know, it's the guy's dying. <laughs> I, put him in the, I didn't want, I didn't have it in my heart to really ask him anything. I wanted to ask him a lot of things, but uh, uh, he goes, um, I have two things to tell you. And uh, one was, I want you to say goodbye to, uh, and send my best wishes. And he named off about, I don't know, seven, eight of his uh, friends, including two of his college roommates at Orange Coast College, but then some people he had work, worked with. He just wanted me to say that he would see, if he wasn't going to hell, because he always thought he was, he always said he was going to hell. He said, if he wasn't going to hell, he still had that sense of humor. Uh, he would meet them wherever, uh, wherever they were. And, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and then he whispered in my ear and told me that there were two people I was relying on extensively for other information. And he told me that I couldn't trust them. Um, and uh, I can't tell you who they are. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and it's been really hard for me to decide why I can't trust them and if I should trust them or what were the motives for telling me this just before he's about to, uh, about to go. And then in the middle of all that, he just uh, he asked me to uh, stop and he just said, it's time to go, to go. you have to go, and this will be it. And so as I was getting up, I looked behind the bed and you know, downstairs there were the books and the libraries and you know, there was this whole public persona, but upstairs in this bedroom, there were all these other medals and these old ribbons and uh, all these awards he received and photos. There were a whole part of his life that he had never let me into, right? Uh, and, you know, so I left with realizing that, you know, this is the best I got, but it's not nearly the full story, right? There's not, I've never said, I never would pretend that that's the full story. This is the first snippet of the life of Pham um, Sunan. I fully expect that there will be better um, and there will be more um, uh, uh, better accounts that uh, uh, rely on the wealth of new information that will become available. And I think only people who are fluent in Vietnamese and, and can get into the archives will be able to write that. So mine is a the American perspective, right? And um, and uh, uh, but I but uh, uh, the other thing I before we run out of time, also I should mention. So you know uh, on. Always, always, and I'll never forget this, when he was a little healthier, he would slam the table um, and with his fist and he would, um, he would paraphrase Lincoln um, uh, and he would talk about uh, uh, what happened after the American Civil War. And, uh, and, and he, he was bitter, bitter about what happened in Vietnam between 1975 and 1984, about what happened in the South. Uh, and the lack of reconciliation compared to what had happened after the American, well, we're still living with the effects of the Civil War and about to begin another one. But the thing is, is that uh, 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 it took a leader, it took a leader uh, like Lincoln uh, to at least put the words out uh, on reconciliation. And, uh, and, and it was time to, to bury, you know, the hate, the hatred and reconcile. And, that finally happened in Vietnam in 1985, 86, and then finally at the first visit by, an Amer by, by a Vietnam, Vietnam president and then an American, American president. I think An would be so happy about all that, but he would still be lamenting the, uh, uh, the lack of a, of a free press, and he would still be lamenting the plight and the crackdown of, on Vietnam bloggers and, and, and the like. I think that would be another area where 
uh, but he would rationalize that, rationalize it as that's the system, you know. Hi. Uh, yeah, I think I might have the final question. Uh, so yeah. No pressure for me there. <laughs> uh, but I don't they, thank you so much for being here. Like everything you had to say is so fascinating. And it, this book, and I think that he he speaks, there's a lot on kind of his positive impression of American ways of thinking and American society. But I do kind of wonder, like, what what would what did he kind of communicate on what he saw as like the disconnect that America and the American people had on like what the challenges are to, towards reconciliation and like kind of thinking about the spear here. And I guess even with like a potential movie, like that audience would be probably very Western. What, like, what are the challenges like there specifically kind of, yes, moving away from Vietnam? Yeah. So that's a really big question. It's a terrific question. And I'll, I'll answer it uh, by saying that uh, um, on, uh, you know, he, th he, he loved Americans, but he thought that the greatest weakness of America was that it always knew better than other countries what how their country should determine their future, right? I interviewed three American ambassadors and three consul generals for this book. And every one of them who knew on and worked with on considered him to be the symbol of reconciliation because um, he, he had lived with Americans, he had worked with Americans, and they all believed, they all bought into my argument, which is that he was a nationalist who only wanted to rid the country of, of foreign aggressors, right? And then, then, but, you know, the American war, and this is my answer, the American war, you have three people, four people riding on Agent Orange. Well, look what we did to Vietnam, right? Look what we did. We used this heinous chemical weapon, right, uh, that is not only poisoning rivers and, uh, for, uh, uh, and, and waterways in Vietnam, but has affected our own American troops as well. But in Vietnam, the areas have been to so toxic uh, that uh, uh, that uh, we did that. So that war didn't just affect, that war did not just affect those who fought in the war, right? It affected the, in my book, I call this the innocents, the innocent ones, the children, right? The grandchildren of who, who had nothing to do with war. Uh, but who were suffering the consequences of being exposed to a to the to the remnants of dioxin, dioxin, you know, which it, which is gets in your DNA, right, and destroys people, right. So that war, the effects of the bombing campaign, the the five hundred and fifty five thousand American troops, the B fifty twos that are still left in lakes as reminders, or. Uh, my one of my the streets that I love going back to. I, I love's a bad word because it's such a it's such a moving experience, but there's something in Hanoi called the Avenue of the B-52s. This was when the B-52s came over over Christmas, and there was collateral damage to Bach Mai Hospital, and you know children were killed. But there was a house that was raised, completely destroyed, in a beautiful residential area. People were killed, and the Vietnamese government, after the war, decided never to rebuild that house and left it there in the middle of the block. And you can go there, and you have all these houses just with that. And so the American war, the American war uh, prevented that reconciliation process from ever happening because, you know, it's not, I, I regret it, but it's not hard to understand why the North Vietnamese would be so upset at the American and their allies for what had been done to their country when, when they shouldn't have been there at all, right? Or, you know, and that's what An always told me. He always said, you know, I thought the Americans would maybe send over 50,000, you know, 25,000. And then they realized, like, this is like Vietnam. It doesn't matter. You know, we're going to we're not going to get involved. We're not going to have 55,000 names on the Vietnam Memorial. We're not going to have hundreds of thousands of dead Vietnamese. But he said, I was wrong. Right. I was, I was wrong. So I think by the time he died, uh, the reconciliation process had gone far, far beyond what he ever had hoped, uh, hoped for. And today would he would be even better. But uh, he really never explained any more to me. The ambassadors did them. You know? So that's the best I can do there. Before we end, I do want to share one thing with all of you, which is I received an email before she died uh, from his wife. Uh, uh, his wife, we didn't discuss his wife today. His, her name was Tunan. You know, a question I should have raised in my, I used my notes. Um, it's in there, uh, which is if I was, you know, he was he was so important. He was recruited. They had invested all this money. They sent him to the United States, and they had picked another woman to, for him to marry. Uh, they had picked a spy 
uh, a military a spy because they thought that uh, uh, she would best protect him and protect their investment. But An had met Tunan and fell in love with her. And he said, no. And, uh, and first, they, there was a big battle about this. You see, it's a sideshow in many ways, but finally they relented and, and she did not know until a few months into their marriage that he was with the revolution. And then she finally, he assisted him and she loved him and you know, she, she then aided him in all ways possible, protected uh, his, his secret. I've always wondered why would the party allow him to marry her? Uh, if, why would they allow that? They were risking everything. What if she had said, whoa, you're a spy? You know, I don't want any part of this, right? Uh, it was a big risk and uh, I can't explain it. Uh, the, uh, people in the movie will explain it and then we'll find out what the answer is. But anyway, uh, Tuna was a remarkable woman and a great source for me and a great, uh, uh, you know, when they, they left Vietnam, they went to the United States they, and then we had, you have thousands and thousands, like your family, thousands and thousands of Vietnamese. Everyone's trying to get out between 75 and 81 and 82, 83. And all of a sudden there's this one Vietnamese family, uh, Tom Tunan's family. They're going to come back the other way. There's no traffic, first of all, right? I mean, uh, they're going to come back to Vietnam. Who, what Vietnamese who escaped is coming back in, to Vietnam in 1979, 1980? There's no one. So there weren't even flights. So what they had to do was on sent word to come back. And when, when as soon as he sent word to come back, that's when people in the States knew that An must have been a member of the revolution. And they saw that picture. So uh, to go back, they had to go to Paris first. They, they left Virginia and they went to Paris. They had to stay in Paris several months. When they left Paris, and they went to Moscow. And then from Moscow, they were able to go to Hanoi. And then from Hanoi, they had to come down to uh, Saigon. Uh, and she had kept the whole family together during this period. And all of them, I interviewed them all, all believed one day they would see their father. They all thought they would see him in Virginia, but not there. But Tunan wrote me this email after reading my book. I just want to read it to you and then think we're out of time, right? Yeah. So I'll just, I want to, if you have class or lunch, I, I, I understand if you have to go, but um, uh, so she wrote me this email. Um, uh, I just wanna read it to you, it'd be a good way to close. Uh, we, understand that bes uh, we understand that beside what An told you, you had a hard, long research to write about him with, ver with verifying and mixing orderly historians regrettable wartime between Vietnam and USA. And the most important thing An requested you in writing about him is keep in secret what is necessary to secure his many friends to whom he had been great, much grateful and you kept your promise to him. If there is another spiritual world, perhaps An is happy about that. Uh, uh, because of my eye problems, last paragraph, I have to read your book three times during three days, although I would like to finish it immediately. Three days full of emotions, three days full of tears of missing, loving, and regretting. And now each time I read it again, I cannot prevent my tears falling in such feeling on my few friends too. But like, I like to read it again and again and again because it helps me to recall my husband. Sometimes reading your book, it makes me think that Anna is still alive, but painfully in reality, I cannot see him anywhere forever. Half of my potty has passed away. The older I get, the more lonely I feel without him. If there is a destiny that all of us have to suffer life like this, why is it so? I want to thank you. My memory is declining, but I feel very close to my husband reading your book. So again, you know, if you ever have a chance to, as a biographer and as an author to receive that from uh, Tunan, just made me feel like, you know, uh, happy, happy, <laughs> that's it. So thank you, I really appreciate it, thank you.